today we are lucky to have uh, uh, dr tara clark so she is a lecturer in department of sociology and anthropology in north carolina state university currently she teaches a uh, a primary conservation seminar and introduction to biology biological anthropology she is an invited member of the iucn primate specialist group section for human primates interaction and has been conducting research and conservation uh, initiative in madagascar for the past 16 years tara serves as a chief primate conservationist for darwin animal doctors a us based non profit organization uh, her work aims to understand the motivation driving the illegal pet trade of lemurs within madagascar this work employs multidisciplinary approach including uh, conservation genetics formal and informal surveys with the local communities collaboration with the local and international ngos as well as conservation outreach and education initiatives so we are uh, lucky to have her uh, this is uh, probably the first person who is going to talk about uh, international speaker uh, and uh, she done extensive studies there so uh, i think over to you uh, tara i mean you can take over from there thank you so much to agreeing to give a talk yeah thank you thank you so much david um and smitha um for organizing this and and for inviting me to speak today i'm really excited to talk to everybody about uh about lemurs which are basically my whole life um and so today um what i'd like to do yes if the slides will work there we go um so i'm going to start with just sort of an outline and kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about today so first um we're going to talk a bit about madagascar um the island and i'll talk briefly about the geological history and then get into some of the um the biodiversity of the island and then the main part of the talk we're going to talk about lemurs the the lemurs are one of the most diverse groups um of primates and we're going to talk about uh, sort of highlight their unique traits and behaviors and sort of what makes them different than other primates then we'll talk a bit about their conservation threats and then we'll um conclude everything and have our our questions okay so let's get started so first to begin um sort of introducing you to madagascar and its spectacular history um i want to talk a bit about the geological history of the island so um it it is sort of the the history of the geological um portion of this is really what has helped contribute to the immense biodiversity that we find today in madagascar So 170 million years ago, if you look at the map here, you can see Madagascar is sort of trapped in between um what becomes South America and Africa, India, Antarctica and Australia. And so this is the supercontinent Gondwana. Um and then slowly over time, uh due to the earth's crust starting to shift and plate tectonics are moving, um the continents start to break apart. and uh madagascar slowly slowly moves um attached to uh to india and then about 88 million years ago madagascar is completely isolated and this is after india has sort of broken off and moved north crashing into asia and creating the himalaya mountains and then madagascar lays in the indian ocean isolated for 88 million years and again This is what is um contributed to the the biodiversity that we see today. And a lot of people don't realize that Madagascar is actually the fourth largest island in the world. Um so it may look tiny when you look at it on the map, but it's an immense place with lots of different types of uh ecosystems and habitats. Um and so yeah, I highly suggest you take a trip there if you can. Uh it'll blow your mind. So one of the really exciting things I think about Madagascar's history is that there's recently extinct megafauna. So up until about 1000 years ago, Madagascar was home to a diversity of uh of giant megafauna. So things like the giant elephant bird which is pictured here, um we had a giant fusa which is sort of a cat-like carnivore, uh pygmy hippos, um we had giant lemurs running around. um so lots of crazy sort of cool animals that were sort of um inhabiting the island and the elephant bird just for example um when we're talking about giant uh this is the largest flightless bird ever to have lived it stood about 3 meters tall and weighed about 450 kilograms um and the eggs that it laid were the largest of any any animal that lays eggs so we're talking about really really big um big animals here 
But for me, the most interesting are these giant lemurs, which are also referred to as subfossil lemurs. And these guys were significantly larger than the species of lemurs that we see today in Madagascar. Um, so the largest were the archaeoindries, and you can sort of um, see these guys sort of illustrated down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, and by large, we're talking about the size of a male gorilla, um, so about 160 kilograms. So these guys were running around uh, with these elephant birds and pygmy hippos and uh, also humans. Uh, so, you know, modern humans overlapped with, with this extinct megafauna, now extinct megafauna. Um, and sadly, when, uh, you know, humans arrived, and we're going to talk about that next, the extinct, the, the reason for, the, we're going to talk about the reasons for extinction. So 17 species of these giant bodied lemurs have gone extinct, as well as the elephant bird, the pygmy hippos, the giant fusa, and lots of other animals. So, you know, how exactly did these giant megafauna go extinct? So there's been a lot of debate over the years and lots of different researchers proposing different hypotheses as to, you know, what happened. And of course, there was a lot of hunting of these subfossil lemurs. Um, so we have lots of fossil evidence um, showing cut marks on the bones. Um, so we know that they were being hunted. We know that they were being butchered and consumed. But recent research actually um, has shown that it was actually a shift from hunting and foraging to agriculture. So farming, herding animals. Um, this combined with a population explosion um, is really what led to the extinction of these animals. Um, so, you know, basically hunting for survival was no longer an, you know, an issue because they were far people were farming. Um, and so, you know, sort of all of these things combined unfortunately led to the extinction of these amazing giant lemurs. So one of the other fascinating things I think about Madagascar is its recent colonization. It's probably one of the last places on earth to, um, to be colonized by, by humans. Um, and so the exact dates um, uh, have been debated, um, but the, the most recent evidence suggests that um, people first arrived in Madagascar about 10,000 years ago. And so this is about 6,000 years earlier than we had previously uh, thought. And there's also been a lot of genetic work done. Um, and so we now know that there has been ind independent colonizations of both Southeast Asian peoples as well as East African peoples. And so now um, I want to kind of get into the biodiversity part, which is um, the part that you're probably the most interested in. Um, and so Madagascar is really quite a magical place. Um, and 90% of the vascular plants that we find there um, can be found nowhere else on Earth. Um, the endemism, so species that are found nowhere else on Earth that you find in Madagascar, it's really just tremendous. It's off the charts. Um, and, you know, to say it's diverse is an understatement. And again, this is all due to having been isolated in the Indian Ocean for 88 million years. So let's talk a little bit about some of the animals that you can find in Madagascar. So here's um, just four of the eight different Malagasy carnivores that you can find in Madagascar. And earlier I had mentioned a giant fusa. So this is today's uh, fusa. So much, much smaller uh, than the giant fusa. Uh, these guys as adults weigh about 26 pounds. Um, they pre predate on lemurs. Um, they're really a sort of tremendous animals. Um, not too large, but um, they're really good hunters. They have retractable claws. They can move up and down trees. They actually mate in the trees. Um, and they're quite elusive, so you're not really going to see one if you're out in the forest. It's usually pretty rare. I've never seen one. <laughs> I've seen some fresh scat, but I've yet to see a real fusa in, in the flesh. Um, and these carnivores are really great. They they're sort of um, quite diverse. So we find them in rainforest habitats. We find them in spiny desert. We find them in grasslands. And seven of the eight carnivore species in Madagascar are actually endemic. So again, we find them nowhere else on Earth. So the amphibians, um, the only amphibians that we find on the island are actually 
frogs. Um, but the diversity of frogs is really uh, great. So 300 species of frogs um, to date and 99% of those species are uh, natural, uh, native to Madagascar. So again, they're endemic. And there's such a you know, crazy diversity with all sorts of weird you know, um, traits and behaviors that we find with all of these different frogs, like the tomato frogs, um, these guys down here, these big red guys, they release this sort of sticky, um, sort of toxic substance, um, which helps to protect them against predators. And humans can actually you know, have some sort of allergic reaction to it. Um, we also have mantella frogs, um, many different species, which have really, really bright colors. Um, and that is sort of how they advertise their toxic skin to, to predators. Um, so lots of really cool, interesting uh, frogs in Madagascar. And of course, reptiles. Um, Madagascar hosts more than 400 species of reptiles, and 96% of those are endemic. Um, additionally, Madagascar is home to half the world's 150 uh, chameleon species. So a lot of different chameleon species in Madagascar, including the smallest chameleon um, known to date, which is this little guy here. Um, this is a little Brukizia um, species, and you can see it's sort of sitting on the edge and the tip of a match stick. So super, super, super tiny. It would probably fit on like your fingernail um, and super adorable. And the exciting thing you know, about Madagascar um, and the biodiversity and, you know, this island just being so huge and having so many different ecosystems and habitats is that researchers and local people and all sorts of people are finding new species every year. Um, so just in 2018, there have been three new uh, chameleon species described. Um, there's new frog species being described every year, um, new insect species. So, you know, the diversity is immense and we're still discovering more. So quite exciting. So um, now I want to talk a little bit about lemurs and how they actually got to the island of Madagascar. So about 60 million years ago, um, pieces of, of land broke off from Eastern Africa. And on these large pieces of, of vegetation that broke off, they sort of floated across the Mozambique Channel um, to the western coast of Madagascar. So it's about a 250 mile trip. Um, and on these floating pieces of vegetation or rafts um, were these little ancestral lemurs. Um, so this happened about 60 million years ago. So um, the paleo currents were just right. Um, they were sort of uh, sweeping these large pieces of floating vegetation across the Mozambique Channel and then crashing into Madagascar. And then what happened is these ancestral lemurs landed in Madagascar. There were no competitors. So there's no monkeys, uh, there's no humans, there's you know, really nothing. And so they were able to sort of spread out across the island um, and they were able to start adapting into different ecological niches. Um, and this is referred to as an adaptive radiation. Um, and we have seen this uh, adaptive radiation with many other species as well. So for instance, Darwin's finches, um, as well as new world monkeys, um, we sort of see these types of things happening. Um, and so then you have a tremendous diversity um, after many, 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 many years. Okay, so, so now let's actually talk about, about the lemurs, uh, the main part of, of the talk. So here you can see uh, a bunch of different photos, um, and this is just, you know, barely scratching the surface in terms of the diversity. Um, of, of lemur species. So lemurs, they're Madagascar's endemic primates. Um, they're an ancient radiation that have been evolving for over 40 million years. And there's over um, 100 species to date. Um, there's about 111 species and still counting. Um, and since the year 2000, 51 new species of lemur have been described. Um, and many of those species are nocturnal. So um, among the lemurs, um, this is where we see the, um, the most uh, nocturnal number of primates out of any group of primates in the world. Um, the lemurs include five major taxonomic groups. We have five different genera, and again, 111 species to date. And these guys are sort of our, you can think of them as your sort of most ancient primate cousins. Um, and they exhibit a lot of different traits 
and a lot of different behaviors than we see in other primates. So they're quite unique. And today it's sort of my goal is to sort of highlight some of the cool, unique traits and behaviors that lemurs have that other species don't. So let's, let's talk about that. So um, for any of you who are primate lovers or you know, visited zoos or perhaps you know, seen primates in the wild, you see especially you know, most primate species are social. Um, they're gregarious, so they spend a lot of time with one another, socially grooming, sleeping next to one another, etc. And so um, the social grooming is a really important part um, of a primate's life, including lemurs. Um, it helps to reinforce their social bonds. Um, it helps to establish uh, bonds, as well as being a health benefit, because um, you're sort of picking off little bugs and ticks and things like that. And lemurs sort of do this social grooming a bit different than monkeys and apes. And so if you've ever seen monkeys and apes sort of grooming each other, you know, they're using their fingers and their hands and they're sort of combing through each other's hair. Um, but here I'm gonna just click out of the screen for a second and I'm gonna show you social grooming lemur style. And there won't be any sound here, but um, you don't really need the sound to get the idea. So here we see two ring-tailed lemurs and they sort of use their hands a bit, but they're not as dexterous um, as other primates. And you can see that really when they're grooming each other, they're using their mouths. Um, they also do this when they're grooming themselves. So totally different than um, what we see with other, other primates. Okay, so now we'll go back. There we go. Okay, so this is social grooming lemur style. And so the, the cool traits that I wanna talk about here that makes lemurs so different, um, one is the tooth comb. So you can see that here. So the tooth comb is really cool. It's made up of six teeth in the lower jaw. Um, so it's the canines and then the four incisors. And this sort of protrudes and sticks out a bit um, from, the lower, from the lower jaw. Um, and they use this tooth comb to groom themselves as well as to groom others like you saw in the video. Um, one of the other really cool things about lemurs is they have a second tongue. Um, so you can see here where the arrow is pointing, um, there's sort of this small second tongue underneath their main tongue. Um, and it's sort of quite stiff, sort of uh, made of a cartilage. And what they do is they can actually clean out their tooth comb with the second tongue and sort of get any little hairs or anything that are stuck in there um, out of it. So really weird, really different. Um, we don't see this with monkeys and apes, um, but we do see this with lemurs. So kind of a, a very interesting way to kind of go about grooming each other. Okay, so I'm sure you guys are really familiar with the movie um, Madagascar, um, King Julian, and sort of that whole sort of um, you know, Madagascar series. Um, it sort of exploded um, several years back and, and is still very popular today. Um, so in the film, uh, the animated film, King Julian is a ring-tailed lemur like you just saw in the video, um, and it's a male character. Um, but the thing is, is that it's scientifically inaccurate. And yes, it is a children's movie, but um, lemurs are actually, uh, most species are, are female dominant. Um, and so this, this film is sort of portraying, you know, these, these ring-tailed lemurs as a, as a sort of a male dominant species, which is sort of incorrect. And for mammals um, and primates included to be female dominant is actually quite rare. Uh, this is not really something that we see um, very much in the animal kingdom. So it sort of makes lemurs quite unique. Typically when we're talking about other primates, the males are the more aggressive sex. Uh, they have larger canines, they have a larger body size, um, and they're definitely more of the, the dominant uh, sex among, among these primate groups. However, in the world of lemurs, girls rule. <laughs> um, and so female dominance is basically what we see with most of the species. Um, and it was discovered all the way back in 1962 um, by the late Allison Jolly, who's pictured here. Um, she was a primatologist and conservationist who was the first person to go to Madagascar and study lemurs. Um, she went to the south and she studied ring-tailed lemurs. 
and discovered that they are a female dominant species. Um, and it turns out they're actually sort of the most female dominant of all the lemur species. Um, the females are quite, uh, can get quite aggressive, um, not only with males, but also with, with other females. And then here I just sort of included, you know, this sort of history of the island and thinking about female dominance is sort of a long history of that. Um, prior to French colonization, um, Madagascar was ruled by different queens. Um, and so here, pictured here is the last reigning queen uh, from Madagascar. And then of course, here we have a, a queen Julian, if you will. And so, you know, we have to sort of ask, well, why, why are lemurs different? Why did this evolve? Why are they female dominant? And what does this look like in terms of behaviors? So, you know, females being the dominant species, um, they are the ones that will have first access to food, uh, food resources. They're going to be able to obtain the higher quality food resources. They're going to be able to have the more safe spot in a tree or a cave um, to, to sleep so they don't get eaten by a predator. And we see a lot of uh, female, female aggression, so uh, fighting for uh, you know, rank and a hierarchy. Um, we will also see females sort of beating up on males. <laughs> you know, if they want to take their food, they'll take their food. If they want to take their spot, you know, in the sun, they'll take their spot in the sun um, and really sort of just do whatever, um, whatever they want. And the female dominance among the lemurs has real, real advantages. So Madagascar is, the island itself is very, in terms of the climate, it's quite harsh. Um, and it can be very unpredictable. Um, so every year there's a cyclone period, uh, the south is prone to droughts, and so um, it can sort of be, you know, harsh and we kind of, you know, never know really what's going to happen. And so this is obviously quite hard for, for, for the animals that are living there. Um, and so by females having this sort of edge um, from being the dominant species and being able to gain access to resources, um, that's going to be really important for their uh, successful reproduction. Um, so that is sort of one of the ideas um, in terms of why uh, this evolved, because it's helping females to become more successful. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, so in terms of looking at female dominance, um, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting uh, research. So we're gonna talk a little bit um, sort of about the most recent uh, research, but first I'm just going to show you a really quick video that was taken um, by a colleague of mine um, a few years ago of a female ring-tailed lemur sort of being quite a jerk to another another uh, lemur in, in her troop, a male ring-tailed lemur. So you'll kind of see here what I mean about sort of they get to do what they want. So here they are just sort of feeding in a tree. Um, this is at a national park uh, in the south of Madagascar, southwest. There she goes, she just pushes them right out of the way, keeps walking, and you can't hear it, but there's lots of squeaks, and, and she's just like, no, this is my food, what do you think you're doing? And then, think, yeah, I the think, other individual- Tara, sorry to butt in, I think the video is not playing. You can't oh, it see didn't the video. play? No, you can't see the oh, video. Oh, no, that's weird. Um, okay, can you see that? Uh, David? Still, no, 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 we can't see. No. It. Probably you have to click that. Yeah. That's really weird. I don't know why that's not working. Um, hmm. Okay, it's, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I don't know. It, it was working on my computer, so I don't know why that's not working. Well, maybe I can put a link to it on the, on the Facebook page or something, and no so problem. people yeah, that's fine. can watch it. Okay. Yeah, so basically the, the, the video clip is a few lemurs feeding in a tree at this national park that I worked in for four years in the south of Madagascar. Um, and the, the dominant female is sort of just, you know, stuffing her face with leaves, and then she sort of pushes one of the males out of the way, steps over him, and then she kind of goes back and knocks him out pretty much out of the tree. Um, and so in female dominant species, um, all of the females are dominant to all of the males. So all of the males are subordinate to any female in the group, and it doesn't matter what their age is. Um, and so the males pretty much have to be subordinate um, and let the females sort of do um, whatever they want. So over the uh, last several years, 
there's been a lot of really interesting research, um, a lot of it done by some of my colleagues here in North Carolina at Duke University. Um, and they've gained a lot of really cool insights into um, the evolution of female dominance in the lemurs. And in particular, they've looked at the role of hormones. And so hormones play a very important role um, in terms of uh, female dominance, especially in ring-tailed lemurs. So a lot of the work that's been done has been done on ring-tailed lemurs um, here at the Duke Lemur Center. Um, if any of you are familiar with that, it's the largest captive facility of lemurs in the entire world where they're doing um, non-invasive research, uh, lots of conservation education and outreach, um, as well as doing programs in Madagascar. So it's a really amazing place. And so we do know that female dominant species, when we look at the hormones of females, um, they have significantly higher levels of male hormones than females in species that are sort of more egalitarian, where you sort of see more equal things going on between males and females. Females in terms, female lemurs in terms of their genitalia are also a bit masculine, masculinized. Um, and so how did that happen? Well, it's through exposure to these hormones. Um, and so these sort of androgens and hormones have um, helped to create um, sort of a more masculinized uh, genitalia for these females. And when females are pregnant, um, and we're talking about female dominant species here, um, they, they get these surges of these androgens, these, these um, hormones when they're pregnant. And it's thought that these surges of these male sort of hormones help them to be more aggressive, um, help them to be more successful in terms of being the dominant uh, sex. In addition, when these pregnant females um, you know, have, are gonna give birth to a female, to a daughter, and those females in the womb, in utero, are exposed to these surges of, of hormones, um, it is thought that this is what helps to masculinize the genitalia as well as brain development and behavior. And it turns out that during the third trimester, uh, when a female is pregnant, um, this is sort of when um, a lot of these hormones are going on. And when the female then gives birth to a daughter, these female daughters end up being the most aggressive females of all. And it's exposure to these hormones while they're in utero. So sort of really crazy, <laughs> crazy kind of cool things. Um, really interesting studies um, done by my friend Nick Reb uh, and others at, at, at the Duke Lemur Center. So crazy, crazy stuff. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more um, sort of about the diversity and some other sort of interesting things about, about lemurs. So here I've pictured um, four different species of, of the 111 species of lemurs. And I do want to say that um, the majority of photos that you are seeing in this talk um, were taken by David Herring, who was a longtime photographer at the Duke Lemur Center, um, who just retired recently. So these are, most of these are not my photos, they're his, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so some other weird, interesting things about lemurs. Um, you'll notice here that some of them, you know, in these little pairs, um, look different. Um, and so we have a male and a female and a baby. So when we see these sort of males and females that have different colors, of their pelage and sort of different patterns, this is referred to as sexual dichromatism. Um, and this is quite common in some species of lemurs where males and females are different colors. Um, so for instance here, this is the black lemur um, male, and then we have the female here with sort of these little white tufts. We also see some really interesting um, locomotion um, with the lemurs. So if any of you are familiar with the shifaka, there's um, many different species. Um, this is the cockerel shifaka, and they do this really cool form of locomotion called vertical clinging and leaping. And so they have very, very strong, powerful legs. Um, they can sort of push off from a tree, turn around, and they're sort of propelling themselves to another tree, and they can go like 30 feet. Um, it's kind of a, a really tremendous thing to see um, when you're standing in the forest. And one of the other really important things um, about lemurs and why we need to protect them and save them is that many of them are really important pollinator species. Um, so for instance, these guys here, these black lemurs, you know, when they're sort of 
uh, foraging and feeding. They've got all sorts of pollen and things like that that'll get stuck in these little wispy hairdos. Um, and so they're helping to sort of, you know, pollinate different plants. Um, there's also a lot of lemur species that are seed dispersers. So they're consuming fruits, swallowing the seeds, and then pooping them out somewhere in the forest. Um, and that actually helps with forest regeneration. Um, so they play a, a very important role in their ecosystems, many of these different lemur species. Okay. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about was olfactory communication or scent communication. So lemurs are unlike most other primates, um, the monkeys and the apes, in that they are much more reliant on olfactory communication or scent communication. So lemurs, depending on the species, will have different scent glands on different parts of their body. And they use these scent glands uh, to communicate lots of different things. Um, and we're gonna talk about those things in a second. And there's been a lot of work done um, on ring-tailed lemur scent communication. And so um, that's sort of the species that I'm gonna focus on here. Um, it's been really, really well studied. So here you see a male ring-tailed lemur and they have three different scent glands. So I have them sort of pointed out here. So here we see a male, um, they have sort of these anogenital scent, scent glands um, uh, on, the, on their back end and they will sort of rub, rub and uh, produce the scent gland to excrete um, the, the secretions like on different substrates. Um, and then this, <laughs> when, when males do, we're gonna talk about uh, a unique behavior that males have, they sort of make this funny little square head where they kind of pin their ears back and you can see he's got his tail sort of between his arms. And that's because he has these wrist spurs and these anti-brachial glands so there's scent glands in the wrists, and then there's also scent glands here in the shoulders, which are kind of hard to see. Um, and you can, the males will actually rub these scents together on the tips of their tails. Um, and the reason for that is they do something unique called stink biting. Um, and this is a behavior that's unique to ring-tailed lemurs. Um, this is when males during the mating season compete with one another to gain access to females. Um, and so you'll watch them sort of kind of chasing each other around. They'll scent their tails, they waft them over their heads, um, and sort of they do this back and forth. Sometimes it can become sort of physically aggressive, um, and, and males can get very, very severe, severely injured or die. Um, but a lot of the times it just sort of kind of goes back and forth, wafting these scents at each other, um, and then eventually there's a winner. So here's a little video I took, hopefully it works, um, in the same national park, Samantha Suits National Park, um, a couple years ago of some males doing some stink biting. So hopefully you guys can see this. So we have a few different males that we'll see and they were sort of came right along the path I was walking on. And this was one of the study groups that I worked with. And you see the tail starting to go over his head. And here comes another one. And he kind of wafts it and then runs. So I don't know that he's going to be the winner. And then you'll see him here. He's scent marking with his wrist spurs and glands. He's scent marking the trees. Um, so he's really trying to say, like, look at me. I'm the dominant male. I'm going to win this stink fight. And, you know, hopefully the, you know, the female will want to mate with me. And so you'll see them sort of just running around. Sometimes they go so fast um, and they're just kind of go bonkers um, back and forth, scenting their tails at each other. I think we've got a couple more instances here. He's waiting for him to come. And again, this is a, a very unique behavior that we only see with male ring-tailed lemurs. And here you can see the scent marking of the tail, and then it goes over the head, and then he sort of moves towards the other male. So yeah, so that is stink fighting. Whoops. So again, super, super interesting and super cool. Um, there's also um, some more recent research that has been done um, where we have discovered that males also do a, a behavior called stink flirting. Um, and this is how male ring-tailed lemurs woo the ladies, if you will, during, um, during mating season. So we're going to see if this 
if this video works. So here you see the male wafting his tail right at the female's face and they get really, really close. Sorry, it's again, it's no, is it not working? This is not working. It didn't work? No. Oh, shoot. What is going on? Hmm. I don't know why it's not working. Okay, well, we're gonna have to post these um, so people can see. I'm really sorry about that, guys. Um, so with the stink flirting, uh, unfortunately you couldn't see it, but the males are actually scenting their tails as they did in the last video, but then they move really close to the females and they will waft those tails right into their faces. <laughs> and you know, if a female's receptive, um, then you know, and she decides that's the male she wants to mate with, then maybe she's okay with it. They'll start grooming each other um, and perhaps mate. Um, but a lot of times, you know, the females aren't ready to mate yet. Um, they have a very short period of estrus, um, you know, like within a 24 hour period. Um, and so when they're not quite ready yet, they tend to sort of just slap and beat up the males until they go away. Um, so they just keep trying until, you know, hopefully they're successful. So, you know, what are lemurs, um, what are they communicating? What, what's sort of going on um, with these encoded messages that they have? Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can communicate through scent if you're a lemur. So you can find and attract mates. You can um, interpret the genetic relatedness of another individual um, and the quality of an individual. You can also, um, there's been some really great research done by my friend um, Rachel Harris and others at Duke um, where they were looking at injured males and looking at sort of, you know, scent marking between different males and um, they can actually detect the weakness of an injured male. Um, they are doing territorial marking. So you'll see a lot of sort of scent marking on the substrates throughout their different home ranges. So you can sort of figure out who belongs and who doesn't. Um, and individuals will scent mark on top of others, individual scent marks. Um, and of course, you know, for competitive reasons, asserting your status and um, maintaining dominance hierarchies. Um, so lots of different types of encoded messages uh, through these different scents. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about um, probably one of the cooler <laughs> the cooler things um, about lemurs that a lot of people aren't aware of, um, and that is the um, hibernation. Um, so yes, we have primates that hibernate. It's super weird. Um, so pictured here are um, fat-tailed dwarf lemurs. Um, so these are nocturnal lemur species, um, and we find this particular species in the dry deciduous forests of both Western and Southern Madagascar. Um, and so, the hibernation for these guys can last up to seven months. And throughout this seven month period, they sort of have these arousal um, periods, sort of where they kind of wake up. Um, and the thing that's sort of going on physiologically is that their temperature drops um, and sort of will kind of be at ambient temperature. Um, their heart rate slows down, their metabolism, sort of everything is really, really slow. So they have short little periods of arousal and then they sort of kind of go back into their hibernative state um, and the reason that they're able to do this is uh, during the wet seasons when there's lots of food availability, they're just filling up on fruits and flowers as much as they can possibly eat. And they store all the fat in their tails and they can actually um, gain up to 40% of their body weight just in their tails um, while they're sort of waiting for this dry season to come. And this is when they go into hibernation. So there's sort of these real dry seasons, food is going to be quite scarce. And so this is a way to sort of cope with this challenging environment for these guys. Okay. And there's um, more recently, there's been a couple of other species um, that have been, uh, other species of dwarf lemur that have also been uh, discovered to hibernate. These guys are found in the sort of Eastern rainforests where it's much colder. Um, and of course, there's gonna be a lot more rain. The interesting thing about these two species is they hibernate underground. So if you can see here, um, this is my friend Marina Blanco, who's been doing a lot of this work. Um, what they're able to do is they can find these little dwarf lemurs sort of right under the surface. Um, and they're able to dig them up while they're hibernating um, and sort of you know take some measurements and sort of 
put little microchips or collars on them so that way they can kind of find them again and figure out sort of, you know, what is going on and how they're able to do this. And the cool thing is, is that, you know, dwarf lemurs, they don't have claws. Um, you know, they're a primate. Um, all primates have nails, just like us. We're a primate. Um, so it's sort of interesting that they can kind of dig enough in the ground to sort of make these little hibernacles, um, you know, and hibernate for months at a time. So super interesting. Okay, and so I couldn't give a talk about lemurs without talking about the weird and wonderful II. So if you haven't heard about the II, um, hopefully you're gonna be a giant fan after this. Uh, they're the largest of the nocturnal lemurs. They are probably one of the weirdest animals that you'll ever see, um, if you're lucky enough to see one. Um, they, they have these sort of giant, giant ears and these shaggy tails um, and you'll see here this mom and the baby. These are, these are all guys that are um, at the Duke Lemur Center in captivity and they're sort of sharing this little egg. And they have a lot of really weird features and adaptations. Um, so the II basically fills the niche of a woodpecker. So on the island of Madagascar, we don't have woodpeckers, but the II fills that niche. So they're doing something called percussive foraging. So like a woodpecker would knock on the wood and, and pull out little you know, insects, the II actually uses its elongated skeletal, sort of you can see here, middle finger. And what they're doing is they're tap foraging on logs, dead logs. Then they use those sort of giant ears to kind of zone in and, and listen for grubs. And then they have rodent like incisors that will, you know, they're just ever growing. And then they can gnaw a hole into the wood. Then they stick their middle finger, this, this skeletal finger, down into the hole. It works on a ball and socket joint. So it kind of scoops and then it can pull it out and then they can eat the grub. <laughs> so it's really, really crazy. Um, and I'm assuming this video is not going to work, which is a bummer. But um, we'll, we'll post everything for you guys um, so you can kind of go back and see or do your own Google um, searches for II videos. Um, one, of the, one of the other cool things that's been sort of recently discovered about these IIs is they did some thermal imaging of them while they were doing their tap foraging. And you can kind of see here, here's the one uh, middle digit here that's black. And then here you kind of see it more lit up. So they realized when they're tap foraging or using that digit, it's actually energetically costly. And so it sort of lights up um, because it's using energy. Whereas when it's not in use, it's sort of, you know, at a cooler temperature. And you can see here in the thermal Im imaging, it's dark. Um, so super weird and super cool. Um, and then the most recent work that was sort of an accident that some anatomists were, you know, doing a, a dissection on an animal that had passed. Um, and they discovered that it has a pseudo thumb, um, a six digit. So you can kind of see here, this little, this little um, nub, this is actually a six digit. Um, it's called a pseudo thumb and they can actually, it actually helps them when they're locomoting on branches and to be able to grasp and to grab. And it's weird that we never knew about it until now, but, um, but we know about it now and it's super weird and, you know, made a lot of uh, splash in the news about this primate having a six digit. Okay, so now we're going to talk things, uh, talk about some stuff that's a little bit more serious, which is why are lemurs under threat? Well, Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world, um, and people there live on less than $2 a day. Um, so the poverty is immense. Um, unfortunately, there's um, a lot of corruption. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of political instability. Um, so there's a lot of contributing factors um, into sort of, you know, the different conservation threats that we see. Um, things like slash and burn agriculture, um, which you can sort of see here in this photo uh, with, with the fires. Um, where they're sort of slashing down forests, burning, and then going back to use them to, to farm. And then eventually the soil won't be good anymore um, and they can't use that plot to farm. So then they have to move on to the next patch of forest. And so this happens over and over and over again. Um, it's practiced all throughout the country. Um, so obviously this is quite unsustainable. There's also um, a lot of illegal logging, um, in particular for precious hardwoods. Um, so here, this is a picture of some illegal rosewood that was cut. Um, you know, these are huge old 
um, you know, beautiful trees in these, in, in these rainforests that are being cut down um, and then turned into beds or guitars and things like that that are sold overseas. Um, and of course, just like with other, other um, primates, um, you know, it's not just habitat loss. Um, you know, there's other things. There's climate change. Um, there's, you know, hunting for consumption. And then there's also hunting and keeping the animals and selling them for the pet trade. So unfortunately, um, this is a newer issue for lemurs. And we know that from 2010 to 2013, um, 28,000 lemurs were impacted by the trade. Um, but there's, you know, not a lot of research yet. Um, and so we don't know a ton yet um, sort of about the situation in Madagascar with, with the pet trade. But this is something that I'm working on and um, many of my colleagues are sort of working on. So it's a new area of research, um, but it's something that's really, um, you know, devastating lemur populations for sure. Okay, and so to conclude, um, I just wanted to sort of, you know, the takeaway from this talk is that, you know, lemurs are endangered. They are the most endangered group of mammals in the world. Uh, so 95% of lemurs are critically endangered um, or, you know, listed as endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, so it's not a good situation. And actually, um, just over 60% of all primates are threatened with extinction. So um, things are not really in a good place right now for, for living primates. Um, and Madagascar, of course, as hopefully you took away from this talk, there's sort of just an unparalleled um, diversity there in terms of ecosystems, plants, animals, etc. And the lemurs are really unique. Um, you know, we only scratched the surface today in terms of traits and behaviors, um, but they're quite unique. They're not monkeys, they're not apes. Um, they're just sort of these cool primates unto themselves. And there's more to be discovered. Um, so I mentioned that there are still new, new species being discovered. Um, that goes for lemurs as well as other species in Madagascar. So we still have so much to learn. Um, and so that we need to make sure that these animals are being protected, that their forests are being protected. Um, and the way to do that, you know, there's lots of different ways to do that. Community-based conservation, um, you know, supporting small groups, uh, you know, NGOs or, you know, ecotourism responsibly. Um, but we're running out of time and lemurs really, really need our help. So, you know, um, if anybody's interested in learning more about that, you know, um, feel free to, uh, to reach out. And that was, uh, that's it. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry about the videos, but we'll post them. Thank you so much, Tara. What a fantastic uh, talk. I mean, I'm oh, thank you. hearing all this, you know, it's amazing <laughs> to learn all those things. Yeah, so there are a few questions in the chat box. So. Yeah, I'll pull that up. Um, okay. okay. Oh, I'm so sad about the videos. Okay. Um, I'm how sorry, can we... Uh, Facebook Live also, there was a bit issue with the Zoom also. Today it was a bit messy. Oh, no. no okay, well, okay, we'll, put, we'll post everything. Yeah. Um, so how can we find male and female II lemurs? So um, it's very difficult. So um, they're quite elusive. Um, and they're nocturnal. And despite being the largest of, of the nocturnal lemurs, um, it's really, really rare to, 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 to go out into a forest at night and to see one. You're a very, very lucky person if you do. Um, and it, you, know, you could be working in Madagascar for 20 years and have never seen one. I haven't. Um, so it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, the other thing that I didn't get to mention is there's a, there's a negative sort of taboo in, in parts of Madagascar where um, unfortunately, when, when Malagasy people, some Malagasy people think that if they see an II, um, they come across one, that it's going, somebody in their family will die. So they are killed for that reason. Um, so that's sort of unfortunate. They are endangered. Um, they do have a wide geographic range, so they are found in lots of different parts of Madagascar. Um, but we just still, we don't have enough information on them. But there is a lot of interesting work being done by one of my colleagues um, at Lewis who has actually been able to collar, um, capture and collar some IIs and track, track them in the forest. So um, that's probably um, one of the cooler things that, that's been done with IIs. Um, average lifespan of lemurs, and at what age do they um, attain maturity? Um, okay, good questions. Yeah, so it depends on the species. So for instance, these small little mouse lemurs, which we didn't talk about today, the smallest one is about 30 grams. Obviously, these guys have shorter lifespans. Um, and predation is quite high. Um, so maybe, you know, I don't know, seven years or so. 
in the wild. Um, and then we can have larger lemur species. They can live into their 20s. Um, and in captivity, they can live um, even longer. And again, it might depend on, on the species and it depend on, you know, on sort of where they live within Madagascar um, and sort of, you know, what the hunting pressure may be or, um, you know, how many different types of predators they have. Um, and in terms of attaining maturity, it depends on the species. So I've worked mostly with ring-tailed lemurs. Um, and so females will attain maturity around two, two and a half years of age, and males will be a little bit later, like three, uh, three years of age. Um, okay, Sarah uh, Champati asks, is tourism playing a significant role in conservation of wildlife in Madagascar? If so, can you quantify? Um, yeah, tourism is one of the um, big contributors to, to local economy in Madagascar. And of course, that um, because of COVID-19, um, obviously that is not happening. So it's, pro it's been quite devastating. Um, and there's a lot of tourism in all different parts of the island. A lot of people do go to see the lemurs because it's the only place in the world that you can see them. Um, in terms of quantifying it, I, I don't have any sort of numbers or statistics, um, but it definitely does play a huge, a huge role um, in terms of uh, contributing to the economy and, of course, uh, people learning about the, the endemic wildlife. Um, so we have... Loris in Sri Lanka, what is the relationship? Ah, great question. Yeah. Um, so lemurs and lorises are closely related. So there's a group, um, we sort of refer to them as the strepsorines. Um, and so the strepsorini is the infra order if we're talking about taxonomic groups. Um, and so there's the lemurs, the lorises, the bush babies, and the pados. Um, and so the lorises are found in Asia, pados and bush babies are found in um, Africa. And so these guys are more closely related. Um, all of the lorises and the bush babies and pottos are uh, nocturnal, um, and they also have tooth combs. Um, I didn't talk about the grooming claw, but they also have grooming claws. Um, they get that eye shine at night, so if you are walking through the forest with a flashlight, you can kind of catch their eye shine just like you can with lemurs. So there are a lot of similarities between them. Oh, thank you, uh, Shibu, uh, for Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Um, interesting talk, any evolutionary reasons behind the scent communication? So, um, yeah, so these guys, um, like I kind of had mentioned, these guys are sort of the most ancient, if you will, of the living primates. Um, and so they have sort of some of these weird, unique traits and behaviors. Um, and in terms of some of their, um, their anatomy, like their um, olfactory bulb um, and some other features are sort of, a little bit different um, than, uh, than we see with the monkeys and apes. Um, and so they're just better at scent communication, um, more reliant on it um, than, you know, with, you know, the visual uh, communication, <coughs> excuse me. And in terms of sort of the real sort of deep reasons behind, you know, why they're doing this in terms more than other, other species, um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, you know, a lot of other species, um, they're, you know, they have different color patterns and they can sort of use this visual communication. They're using vocal communication, which lemurs also do. Um, but, you know, this scent communication um, is sort of a whole other world. Um, and, you know, it can depend on the species. It can depend on the sex, the, you know, what season it is, um, if you're injured, if you're not injured, um, the sort of the compounds that are made up in these, you know, that are secreting out of these scent glands can change um, and sort of, so it's a really interesting area of, of study, but I certainly, I'm not an expert on it, um, but I can certainly point you to some papers and others that um, can probably answer your questions better than I can. Um, so I heard that some shifakas are extremely adaptive like the ones in the spiny thickets. How do they find food? Yes, um, so the, um, the Varroa shifak, um, where they're found in the southern parts of Madagascar in the spiny desert, um, some of them, and yes, they're, they're extremely well adapted. Um, and they're, it's really interesting because shifakas don't consume water. Um, so you think about these animals living in these really warm sort of deserty climates, um, and then the way that they consume water is through leaves. So they're leaf specialists. Um, and so, you know, they're just sort of finding, you know, whatever they can, I guess, during these sort of harder times. Um, leafs, um, you know, they do eat other things like, you know, flower buds um, and things like that. So uh, yeah, 
and unfortunately, you know, if there are like severe droughts and things like that, um, you know, obviously there's going to be higher mortality rates, but they are really good at sort of finding things to eat, uh, you know, even, even in these sort of uh, extreme environments. Uh, Okay, lemur ancestors arriving on Madagascar on floating vegetation. Is this more of a hypothesis or do we have evidence? Um, we do have evidence. And like I had mentioned, um, we, ha we do have evidence of this um, with other species like New World monkeys um, uh, in, in the New World in the Central and South America, as well as Darwin finches. Um, and so the, the, the way that we have sort of um, looked into this is you can look at uh, fossil evidence, you can look at genetic data, um, you can re uh, sort of look at the paleo currents during, you know, during the time period when these animals were evolving and sort of understand sort of, you know, the, the placement of the continents um, and which way the, pale, like the currents were going and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways um, and sort of pulling different pieces of evidence together um, sort of kind of pulls the whole picture together. Um, lemurs only give birth to female or what? Uh, so lemurs will give birth... Um, to males and females. Um, most lemurs will give birth to one baby at a time. However, there are species that will give birth to more. So ring-tailed lemurs can have twins. Um, and so that could be two females, it could be two males, it could be a male and a female. Um, you know, mouse lemurs will give birth to multiple um, babies. The ruffed lemurs, um, black and white and red ruffed lemurs, they can give birth to small litters. Um, but typically it's just one. That's sort of more typical for primates. Um, is the loris related to lemurs? Yes. Um, so I think I, we talked about that before. I have a lot of photos, Shafakas dancing, jumping. Do they do that to attract mates? Um, no, actually. So um, the pictures that you saw of the Shifaka when I was talking about the vertical clinging and leaping. Um, so the Shifaka are adapted to vertical cling and leap through the forest um, from you know, substrate to substrate. So they're not adapted and their anatomy is not sort of evolved to move on the ground. So when they do have to sort of move between areas where there's been deforestation um, or they have to get to sort of one spot to another but there's no trees, they will sort of do that leaping, dancing, skipping motion um, across these little um, areas where there's you know, no other way for them to, to, to get there. So it doesn't have anything to do um, with attracting, attracting mates. And do lemurs have calls like other primates? Yeah, um, there's all sorts of different behavioral, I'm sorry, vocal repertoires depending on, on the species. So they all sort of have their own different types of calls, um, you know, contact calls or predator calls, um, all sorts of different calls. So yeah, depending on the species, um, they're gonna have their own sort of set of, of calls. It's a whole other area of, of research. Um, predators of lemurs. Um, yes, so the fusa is definitely a huge predator. Um, also raptors, um, different species of large raptor. Um, and in Madagascar, we have the ground boa and the tree boa. Um, so they will also predate upon um, lemurs. And what else? Humans, that's a big one. <laughs> so yeah, so there's several different um, predators. Uh, evolutionary reasons why for female dominance in lemurs compared to other primates. Yeah, so I think I sort of tried to um, relay that in the talk, but maybe it wasn't really coming, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's hard to explain. But basically, um, you know, the island of Madagascar is sort of known for this unpredictable climate. It can be harsh. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of cyclones. They can be prone to drought. We have a mountain range that sort of runs down the middle of the island. And so you sort of have all these different types of habitats. Um, and of course, with climate change, that sort of you know, brings things to a whole other level. Um, but it's thought that female dominance um, has provided females um, with the sort of edge in terms of being able to have access to resources, um, you know, and so they can kind of outcompete the males. Um, females are the ones that bear the burden of reproduction. Um, and you know, for for primates, as with other other animals, it's all about you know getting your genes out into the next generation. So you know, getting pregnant, raising that offspring, and then doing it all over again. So this is sort of what primates do. So it's really important for them to have uh, raise successful offspring. And so by having this advantage, by being dominant. Um, it's possibly giving them that edge. So this is sort of one of the 
uh, one of the reasonings. And of course, sort of all the sort of ho hormone things that we were talking about as well. Thank you for enlightening on Madagascar history and details regarding them as well. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening, guys. Uh, so is hunting for fish meat a big, big issue? Yeah, hunting is definitely an issue. Um, sometimes it's for, you know, substance to, to, you know, for people just to survive, of course, but then there's also um, hunting where they're, you know, selling the meat um, to like restaurants, sort of as like an exotic, you know, exotic meat for people to eat. So unfortunately, you know, it is an issue with many different, um, many different species are impacted. Okay, wonderful talk. What are present ex situ and in situ conservation pro projects needed or presently going on? Um, well, the great thing I think um, about Madagascar is there's so many wonderful NGOs that are either based in Madagascar, um, doing lots of different types of projects, and there's also a lot of NGOs in, you know, um, in the States, in Canada, UK, wherever, um, that are focusing um, with projects in Madagascar. Um, and there's a lot of facilities here, different zoos, as well as the Duke Lemur Center um, that have uh, projects, you know, that are going on. So it could be everything from, you know, reforestation, um, working with, you know, um, the marine life um, or, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of other, other things. Um, well, there's sorts of, I mean, the projects are sort of, are sort of endless. And a lot of the projects now are community-based conservation. So um, working with local people, learning from local people um, because of their indigenous knowledge. I mean, you know, we can't just sort of, you know, as a, as a Western researcher coming in, it's like, you know, I don't know anything about these, you know, forests. I just read it in books. So it's really, really important in terms of conservation being successful that we work um, alongside with local people. Um, and also, you know, making sure communities, um, figuring out what they need, what they want, you know, if they're, um, you know, wanting projects or, you know, sort of what they need to be successful in their, in their own way. Um, and you could look at the Lemur Conservation Network. Um, it's an online uh, network um, that is, you can look on there and it has a whole list of NGOs um, that are doing work in Madagascar and you can sort of find a bunch of information on the Lemur Conservation Net Network's website about all things in Madagascar if you're interested in sort of finding projects um, to volunteer with. Ah, okay, Sarah says she was um, in Madagascar 20 years ago when tourism was hardly existing, would love to go back one day. Please do, yeah, it's, it's sort of an amazing, it'll blow your mind, I guess, 20 years later of, of, of how it's changed. Right, okay. Thank you, very informative talk. Oh, you're welcome, thank you. Can you explain how to distinguish lorises and lemurs? Sure, so um, again, so they're found in different places. So we have lorises in um, Asia and lemurs in, in Madagascar. Um, the lorises are, are um, all nocturnal. Um, there's less diversity in terms of species. Um, and depending on, you know, I mean, they're gonna be bigger than mouse lemurs, um, but overall lorises are quite small. Um, so we have uh, several different species of slow loris, and then we have several different species of slender loris. Um, and the, these guys are moving in a very different way. They're much slower. They're sort of kind of cryptic. They have different behaviors. Um, and if you were to sort of Google a picture of a loris, a uh, slender loris and a slow loris, and then put it next to any of the lemur species, they don't really look, um, they don't really look alike at all. Um, but all, all are super adorable and cute and endangered. <laughs> so they all need our help. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you so much for all of the, the nice comments. Do female dominance in loris populations as well? No. So to our knowledge um, to date in terms of the research, um, lemurs um, is really where we only see the female dominance in terms of primates. Bonobos, um, which are one of the great apes, they sort of, females can be uh, dominant to males and then there can also be some co-dominance. Um, but in terms of other primates, no. Okay, books or research papers? Ooh, yeah, um, I guess it depends on sort of what your interest may be, but I can certainly put together um, uh, some, a sort of a list um, for you guys um, that, we can, that we can add to the Facebook page, also with the links to the videos. 
And do lemurs have personalities? Um, so I, I actually haven't done research in this, but I would actually, I would have to say, yes, they do have personalities. Um, I've spent a lot of time with wild lemurs and I've spent a lot of time um, over at the Duke Lemur Center. And I do have to say when, I, when I'm with the ring-tailed lemurs and I'm following them, it's sort of like watching a ring-tailed lemur soap opera. Um, you know, you have, you have some individuals that are sort of more laid back. Um, even there was this one female that uh, was in one of the groups that I used to study and she, her name was Onesie um, because she only has one eye. And so it must've gotten taken out in some sort of fight or a predator and she survived, we don't really know. Um, and she was just really chill. Um, she didn't want to have to be bothered with all the, you know, female, female aggression and figuring out hierarchies. And she would sort of just sort of lay back. And then we had, you know, other females that were much more aggressive and they were sort of always sort of picking on the males or always starting something. Um, so certainly everyone, I think they all have their own um, sort of individual personalities uh, for sure. And you definitely see that when you start to spend with them. Yeah. Okay, so I think that was all the questions. So, well, I'm sorry about the videos, and we'll definitely put up some suggestions on books and papers. Yeah. And um, please put your notes. email ID also, so if anybody want to. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, I'll put that in. Oh, whoops! I got to do that to everyone. I sent it privately by accident. There we go. So that's my email. Okay. Um, happy to and answer questions. questions. Yeah. 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 So do a uh, second tooth occur in all the lemurs or lemurs or only certain species? Sorry? The second teeth, the, the tooth. Uh, you said oh, no, the there's a false, tooth. yeah, the false tooth or something, no? The tooth comb? No, the second, yeah, the tooth, yeah. That's occur in all lemurs or only one species yes. of? Yes, they all have that tooth comb except for the eye eye because they have those weird incisors. So their, their dental uh, formula and their teeth are slightly different because they're gnawing those holes through the wood in order to do their tap forging and scoop the grubs out. But all of the other lemurs have that little protruding um, tooth comb as well as the lorises um, and, and bush babies. And so they're, they're also, they've got that uh, trait as well. Okay, I think we are done with the questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tara. It was a fantastic session. I mean, we didn't know these animals exist. I mean, all <laughs> Thank these amazing you. Species and, and amazing uh, behavior. Uh, and we learned a lot today. So hopefully we can go there one day and see all this amazing wildlife. Yeah, and on absolutely. Behalf of, yeah, on behalf of uh, both the Nature Society and Nature Club and uh, and all those who are attended, we extend our thanks and do fantastic more research. We are waiting for more uh, and all the best for your uh, upcoming research and papers and all. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your questions. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to, you know, if you need to email me and, you, you know, want advice on a trip to Madagascar or a book to read, I'm certainly happy to do that. So. Yeah. So Tara's email ID is lemurgirl.clark uh, at gmail.com. That's it, isn't yep. it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Once Bye, again. guys. Go Bye. Good night. Take care. Take care. Stay safe. Yes. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.